us today at Hillcrest. We are honored to have you. Whether you're watching online, whether you're here in the sanctuary, we're honored to have you. I'm going to give you just a few announcements and then we'll get right into the service. Moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas, it's time to start signing up for Vacation Bible School. In your bulletin, there is a QR code and a website where you can get your kids signed up for Bible school. We're expecting this year to be the biggest year we've ever had. We need you to sign your kids up. Go on there, on the QR code, on the website, and you can begin signing up today. If you have any questions about that, you can see Rachel at the end of the service. This is what she looks like. We know there's a lot of new people that don't know who she is. This is her. She'd be happy to answer any question. Vacation Bible School, start signing up today. I want to invite all of our senior saints this coming Tuesday for our senior shopping trip. You can see the information in your bulletin. Senior citizens, you'll be leaving the church at 9 a.m. For more information and to sign up, go out to the welcome desk at the end of the service and get signed up. That's this Tuesday morning, 9 a.m. You'll be leaving the church. Look forward to seeing you there. Moms and dads, this Wednesday night in Awanas, it's Superhero Night, and we need your help because this month we are collecting for Operation Christmas Child small toys. So make sure you bring those in. The kids can get prizes or points or however their Awana system works. But this Wednesday night during Awanas, bring in those small toys. You'll see the collection baskets around the Awanas area. That's this Wednesday night during Awanas Superhero Night, kids, and you'll be collecting small toys. Church family, our last announcement this morning, write this down. Coming up Sunday night, May the 5th, after the evening service, we'll be having our Youth Spaghetti Fundraiser. This will go toward Honduras and their camp. So make sure you write that down. We want everybody to come that night. We're going to have a great night. And make sure you bring your checkbooks and debit cards. We want to do our very best to help those kids out. That's May the 5th, Sunday night after the evening service. It's going to be fantastic. We're glad that you're here today. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you is our prayer. Good morning, Hillcrest. I just told Tyler, I said, Tyler, I don't know if you recorded that video early in the morning, but you were really calm and subdued. <laughs> when beloved church family. And I said, do you know the work I have got to do to get these people crunk here in just the next few minutes? Is anybody happy in Jesus this morning? Is anybody glad that this is the day that the Lord made, we can rejoice and be glad. Come on, stand up, let's sing. I have found his grace is all come. In need, while I sit and learn at Jesus, I am free, yes.
Amen. Will you be seated this morning? Ushers, come down. Men will take up our morning tithes and offerings. And I am thankful that you're here today. If you are visiting with us, we want to welcome you and greet you in the name of Christ our Savior. And uh, if you have not done the QR code, please do that right now. Brother Dave and his team want to be able to minister to you and be a blessing to you this week and pray for you. And that would be our honor. Now, I, uh, I said it in the announcement video, but I'm going to make a shameless plug. Coming up in just a couple of Sunday nights for those teenagers going to Honduras and camp, there is no reason why any of these poor mamas and daddies, there's a lot of single mamas here, a lot of divorced parents here, and they're going to do all they can to send these kids to camp. And this is my first time ever doing it. I ain't been here. I don't know how y'all do it, so I'm just going to tell you how we're going to do it. We're going to bring our checkbook. We're going to sell our wife's second car. We're going to sell hubcaps. We'll bring you credit cards. We're going to do everything we can. There is no reason at all why we can't be a blessing to these kids. And somebody's life will be changed this summer. And I want to be a part of that. And we're going to do that. So that's coming up in a couple of weeks. I am thankful. God bless you for being here. I'm just looking around to see how pretty you look today. It's a beautiful Tennessee sunrise, and God's been good to us. Brother Nathan, I want you to come, and uh, one of our deacons is going to lead us in prayer over our tithes and offerings this morning, and we're certainly thankful that you're here. Brother Nathan, you pray, my friend. Thank you, brother. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, for the privilege to come into your house and to worship you. God, I thank you that you are God that you provided a means of salvation for me and for my family and for everybody, the whole world. God, I thank you so much that you understand and you know so much beyond what our human minds can comprehend. God, even as a 12-year-old boy, as we studied this morning in Sunday school, you were talking with those that were learned teachers, and they were amazed at what you knew. God, I, I thank you that you're so far above and beyond who we are. God, I recognize my place before you, and I bow in my heart here before you. God, we just, uh, we know this morning that we in our church have many needs and our families, and God, we ask that you would undertake for them. And this week, even in our own family, as we face death, God, we know that that's the door into our heavenly place with you. And we thank you again for that provision of the means so that we can spend an eternity with you. God, we thank you for the hope that we have, even in those hopeless situations. God, this morning as we prepare for this offering, I pray that you would help us as a church to administer the funds that you've put under our watch care to the best of our ability, but not to our ability, to your will. Father, we just pray that you would give us the understanding to know where to spend, how to spend, where to save, and how to save and that we would use those to, so, to further your kingdom. God, we just pray that you would bless those who give today. We know that you don't need our money. You've got everything. But God, our hearts, you do, you do want our hearts. And we just pray that you would help us to give this morning according to the way you've blessed us. Thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We pray now that you would bless our time of study, our time of worship. Thank you for all that you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's that time of the service where our church family is giving in their tithes and offerings. And we want to invite you to participate as well. There are several ways that you can participate in being a part of this church family by way of giving. You can go online, hillcrestbaptist.org slash give. And there online, securely, you can give straight to Hillcrest to support the work of God in this place. Or those of you that are more comfortable mailing in your tithes and offerings, you can do that. The address is at the bottom of the screen. Again, two ways to give. You can go online or you can mail them in. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. Let's go now back into the service. It's going to be great.
some young faces up here. I, I, I'm glad to see that the hair color of the band is getting darker. And I, I mean, you and Marty, you know, y'all are in that, that, same, that, that, that more mature of the bunch, you know, around here. But <laughs> Don't you thank the Lord for the Hillcrest Band? Aren't they great? Come on, why don't you stand up with me this morning. Let's continue to worship today. You know this song. Tis so sweet to trust in.
I got like four different messages. I got one on all the stuff going on in Israel. I got one on tithing. Well, I noticed that one didn't get any, uh, that one didn't get any juice response. And I got one, I don't forgot what the other one was. And I've got one that I just cannot get out of my spirit. And I don't know which one, so I might just preach all three this morning. And um, I want you to take your Bible and go to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 12. I was looking at this this week, and I cannot get this out of my spirit for whatever reason. I talked a little bit about it in North Carolina where I was at Tuesday, and I, I really couldn't get it all out. I, I couldn't, I, I felt a whole lot like a, a whole lot of water trying to flow out of a real teeny tiny uh, pipe. I just couldn't get it all to, 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 to flow out. And so I, I've been pondering it this morning. I want to talk to you just for a second over how to get over what you can't get past. There's so many hang-ups and issues and backups and people that have got baggage that come into the house of God. It's almost nearly impossible to have a, a, a Sunday of what you would call real worship liberty because all of us come in holding something in both hands, both feet. It's in our mind. It's in our spirit. We just cannot get past it. I want you to look in the book of 2 Samuel, chapter number 12, in verse number 24. Second Samuel 12, verse number 24. And David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her and lay with her, and she bare a son. And he called his name, say this with me, Solomon. And the Lord loved him. Verse 25, And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah, because of the Lord. Chapter number 12 of the book of 2 Samuel, you're coming to the very end of the greatest trial and tribulation that David is going to deal with. In chapter number 10 and chapter number 11, David has fallen into that wicked sin. He has committed adultery, and then that adultery has led to a cover-up, and that cover-up has led to the murder of probably his best soldier. Uriah the Hittite is murdered there on the battlefield as his troops walk away. And David goes into this time of, of pretending to be one thing, a, a grieving friend and a, a, a gracious king. But ultimately what he's doing is he's covering up the mess because he found out three months prior to that that Bathsheba was pregnant with his child. And so David is there and he's sitting on the throne and he's doing court and he's, he, he, he's doing everything that the king should do. And the Bible says that, that Nathan the prophet, this same prophet, walks into where he's at and he says, David, we got a situation in the kingdom. We got a man in the kingdom that had flocks and he had herds and he had all types of things, but he went and took his neighbor's one little lowly ewe lamb. He took that lamb and he has stolen it. Man, King David raged hot as fire. He said, you tell me who that man is because today will his life be required of him. Nathan, honey, with that holy boldness, looked him straight in the eyeballs and said, David, thou art the man. You had all that you could ever want and your friend had one thing that he loved. He had a bride and you stole his bride and you stole his world and his life and because of that, the sword will not depart from your house. All the days of your life, there's going to be war and there's going to be raging between your children and your family. And David, if that's not bad enough, just as you took blood, so blood shall be taken from you because the child in your wife's belly will not survive. And chapter number 12 is the story of the repentance of David. And he gets into chapter number 12 and you can insert there Psalm chapter 51 where he cries and said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And God forgives David. God has moved on past that 
And finally, David goes back into his wife Bathsheba and they conceive another child. Nine months passes, that baby is born. And she, they take that baby from the womb of its mother. And as old customs would do, before they would lay it upon the breast of the mother, they would hand it to the father and see what the father would call that child. And David holds that baby in his arm and says, Call his name Solomon. The word Solomon, write it in your Bible. It literally means peace with God. Right about the time he hands that child to his mother, the door bursts open and in walks Nathan the prophet. And Nathan the prophet, the last time he was with David, he brought bad news. David's heart sinks. David's heart, it begins to tremble in fear, knowing that the sword would not depart from his house. Was God going to take his child of peace? God, I thought I was right with you. I thought you and I were finally at peace. But this time Nathan comes in and he says, I didn't come with bad news, honey. I've come with good news. You've named that child Solomon, which means peace with God. His name shall not be called Solomon. It shall be called Jedidiah. Do you know what the name Jedidiah means in Hebrew? It means greatly loved by God. You ready? David said, God, I'm okay to be at peace with you. God said, David, honey, we're not just at peace. I love you more than you could ever fathom. You ready? You ready? You know how many times Jedidiah appears in the Bible? Every time that David looked at that boy... God thought one thing, but David thought another thing. God said, I love you. David said, I'm just at peace with you. What happened? David couldn't get over it because he couldn't get past it. God was thinking one thing about that baby, but David just couldn't get over what he had done. And because he couldn't get over it, he couldn't get past it. There are people in this room right now that will watch online. There are people that are all over this state and this country. They are battling with things and they just cannot get over. They just cannot get past what God has already gotten over and what God has already gotten past. But today you are stalled because you can't get over what you can't get past. Can I give you three truths right quick and then give you three more truths? Let me give you number one. We all got issues. That's number one. Every one of us in this room, don't you act like you've got this Baptist thing figured out just because you found you a dress at J.C. Penney's and had that $9.99 sale. You ain't no more special than me, and I'm not no more special than him. We've all got mess-ups. We've all made mistakes. We've all had falls. We've all had failures. Some people messed up over there. Some people messed up over there. Some people tripped up back there. Some people tripped up over there. We all have sins in our past. We've all got sins in our life. We've all got skeletons that if the closet it was opened up, we would be absolutely embarrassed. But there are people in this room right now, you, you just cannot get over how you messed up back there. You can't get over how you sinned back there. I don't know what it was. I wouldn't pretend to know what it was. It doesn't really matter what it was. You know why? Because there are no perfect people in this house. There are no whole people in this house. We're all just a bunch of cracked pots, not cracked pots, cracked pots, and we're sitting in the house of God, and all that we're trying to figure out is I hope nobody finds out what I did back there. Can we just go ahead and get it out from the back of the balcony to the choir? How many of you this morning have ever messed up one time in your life? Okay, then we're all on the same page. Every single one of us mess up. You belong in the house of God. The devil's got you thinking that just because you've got a back there that you don't belong right here. Don't you ever think that just because you got something back there, you don't belong right here. We've all got something back there. But if you're not careful, you won't get over it and you'll never get past it. If you refuse to get over that you've got a mess up back there, you'll never get past it. We all mess up. How many of you wish you could undo a decision you made back there? Some of the wives are raising both hands right now. (laughs) We've all got decisions we wish we could redo. 
But so many people live back there because they can't get past it. If I had only done this and that, my life would be different. You're probably right. But it ain't, and you ain't, and this is where you're at. But if you don't get over it, you never get past it. Number two. Number one, we all mess up. Number two, are you ready? This is going to be deep, but it's just as true as it can be. Jesus' blood forgives everything. There is not one mess up that the blood of Jesus Christ cannot wash you clean of. There is not one sin that is so bleak and black and abysmal that the loving, royal, regal, redeeming, washing red blood of Jesus Christ cannot wash clean, cannot do away with, cannot get out of the way. Honey, right now, You've got things you can't get over and God don't even remember what they were because somewhere way back yonder you got on your knees and said, Great God in heaven, I'm begging you in the mighty blood-stained name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, I'm begging you right now to forgive me. And in that moment, you were waiting on some sweet little feeling to come across your life. What you've got to realize, there are no sweet little feelings that come across your life because way back yonder on Calvary's tree, the only feeling that needed to happen happened way back there when God the Father turned his back on his only begotten son so that today in your sin he would not turn his back on you. But it's all gold. But you can't get over it. You can't get past it. You say people won't let me forget. They probably ain't going to. People won't let me get past it. The only reason that people bring up junk in your trunk is because they don't want you opening up their trunk. The only reason that people want to focus on you is because they hope nobody focuses on them. Come on. You know one good thing about living on social media and having the presence? Everybody knows everything about you. It's all out there. Why in the world are you staying back there when God's already up there? You're living in your past and God's already in your tomorrow. But you can't get over what you can't get past. Some of you right now need a theology lesson. And here is the theology lesson. You cannot mess up so bad that Jesus will not forgive you. You cannot fall down so hard that Jesus will not forgive you. You cannot trip up so much that Jesus will not forgive you. You cannot make a mistake so big that the blood of Jesus Christ will not wash you as white as the snow that falls in the winter time. Our God is so wonderful. Our God is so holy. Our God is so righteous. Our God is so loving. I'll tell you how good and righteous and holy our God is he doesn't care what anybody thinks about it he'll still forgive you God doesn't care what other people think about him and today you're the only one that can't get over it God's already passed it number three the third thing you've got to write down is this here's the third truth Looking back will only trip you up. Looking back will only trip you up. Are you ready for this? I'm not the best of drivers. Amen. I'm not, shut up. I've never pretended to be. <laughs> this past week, I had to go to North Carolina and uh, had to pack up more of the house and I got that truck, and so I decided I can pull a trailer. I got a tandem axle trailer that I hooked up behind that truck. Let me tell you, if you'd have painted that thing brown, you'd have thought I was a UPS driver, baby. I mean, I knew I could whip that thing in and out. The problem was I should be on medication. But I'm not. <laughs> and that truck I got, Troy, there's this rear view mirror. You know, a normal rear view mirror, when a trailer's hooked up, you can't see behind the trailer. But I got this mirror that's a screen. 
And when you hook the trailer up, if there's a camera on the back of the trailer, it'll show you. It's like watching a little movie screen. I don't like driving during the day. It makes me nervous. There's too many things going on. So I've decided that if I drive at night, I don't get distracted. It was all going so well until I made my way out of the mountains of eastern Tennessee. But before you get to the Asheville area, you know there's this little snaking path on I-40 that runs about like that right there. And they've got it honed down to two lanes with road construction. And I don't know what I ran over. <laughs> but I hit something. I don't know if it was a tire. I don't know if it was a turtle. I don't know if it was a road construction man. I have no idea what I ran over. <laughs> but I remember, I got that mirror. I'm driving 82 mile an hour down that highway. And I'm watching that little mirror. You know what else my truck has got? It's called lane departure. When you get outside of your lane, it'll give you a vibrating seat. <laughs> Terry, you know what I found? If you keep it outside the white line long enough, it's like 15 minutes at the mall. So help me, I almost obliterated my entire ride all because I was looking at a little mirror. I was trying to figure out what was behind me. And I got this big old windshield showing me everything in front of me. Now I'm running 80 mile an hour down the highway. There's no way I'm going to stop and go back. I'm only going to go forward. But yet I'm focused on that one little thing in that mirror trying to figure out what in the world, how in the world. There are people in this room right now. God's giving you a great big future out in front of you, but all you're doing is looking back and you can't figure out why you keep tripping up. You can't figure out why you keep falling down. Well, if I'd have only done this, that thing wouldn't have fallen up part. You can't undo that. You can't go back and change that. You've got to give that to the God who's back there and the God who's right there and up there and say, Lord, I can't change that. I'm not looking back on that. I'm going to look forward at everything you've given me because I refuse to not get past it because I can't get over it. Amen. What is it you're holding on to like the plague? that eats you alive every day of your life because you'll never get over what you won't get past. How do you get over what you can't get past? I'll give you three things right now, three ways to get over from this Scripture how to get over what you can't get past. Number one, in order to get over it and get past it, you have to hear His love. Watch what it says in verse number 25. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the what? The prophet. Whenever God wanted to tell David that he still loved him and named his boy Jedediah, he could have written it up in the stars. He could have spelled it out in the sky. Doesn't Psalm 19 tell us that the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork? If God wanted to show David how much he loved him, he would show it to him. But he didn't send a sign. He sent a word. Do you know why? Because if you see it, we walk by faith, not by... You keep saying, God, just show me it's over. God says, I'm not going to show you anything. I'm going to tell you. Because if God shows you, it won't require faith. But if you simply grab hold of the Word, you've walked by faith, you've just conquered the very thing that made you stumble back there. When you stumble, it's because you succumb to the flesh. 
But when you walk in faith, you're overwhelming. The, I'm helping myself right now. You overwhelm the flesh. And by saying, God, I may not feel forgiven. I may not feel your love, but I'm believing what that book said. That book said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You said if we confess our sins that you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us. God, I may not feel it. I may not see it, but I'm reading it, and I'm hearing it, and I'm trusting. And in that moment when you do that, you've just conquered the very flesh that made you stumble, and you're walking in the Spirit that causes you to have victory. Brothers and sisters, some of you in this room right now have had a war with God, and you keep saying, Lord, just let me know I'm forgiven. Let me know it's behind me. You ready? It's behind you. He's over it. Move on and get past it. That's the only thing God's going to do is give you the Word. If you refuse to walk in the Word, you'll constantly stumble in defeat. Is anybody else hard-headed? I am. You know, how many times have I told the Lord, Lord, just send somebody my way that lets me know X, Y, and Z. And somebody comes along and tells you X, Y, and Z, and the first thing we do, now, Lord, I don't know if that's what you were talking about, too. <laughs> Am I, I can't be the only one. Don't you act like that. I'm telling you right now, you've been asking him and asking him and asking him. And God sent a little preacher from North Carolina to let you know it's over. Amen. Move past it. Amen. You're over here saying, God, I'll be okay to be at peace with you. God says, I don't want you to be at peace with me. I want you to know I love you. I don't want us to just be friends. He said, I want you to know I love you. So in order to do that, you're going to have to hear. Number two, not only are you going to have to hear, but you're going to have to see. Now watch this. You say, no, wait, I thought you said God wasn't going to let me have a sign of His love. God will never show you a sign of His love because the greatest sign of God's love was Jesus Christ impaled to the cross. There's no bird fluttering through the air that's going to be greater than Christ on the cross. But he will let you see how good he is. You ready? Watch who walks into the room. The Bible says that Nathan the prophet. Do you know what the name Nathan means in the Hebrew? The name Nathan in the Hebrew literally means a giver. Time out. The last time Nathan walked into that room, he wasn't a giver. He was a taker. And now every time that David saw Nathan, you know what he thought? God's about to take something else. You see, that's where you'll get if you don't get over it and get past it. You'll constantly think that every bad thing that happens in your life is God being mad at you. But this time he walked in, he said, David, I didn't come to take anything today, baby. I came to give you something. Last time I took your heart, this time I'm going to give you the heart of God. Brothers and sisters, you know why you and I need to realize it's over? Because Lamentations chapter 3, verse number 22 down through verse number 24 tell us that every day when the sun comes up, it is of the mercy of the Lord that we are not consumed. And every day when the sun comes up with the rising of the sun, the mercies of God are brand new every day. Do you know what brand new means? means as if nothing has ever happened to it. Smack dab, fresh out of the wrapper, new. Troy Peach, I despise the beach. I hate the beach. My wife and, and my family and her family, they would go to the beach and just sit. You 
you paid $3,259.42 to just sit. I can't do it. I can't do it. I, I, I refuse to do it. I've come too far in my life. I got a 13-year-old boy. He don't want to sit. I ain't sitting. We ain't sitting. And the nastiest thing you can do is get in the ocean. I don't know if you know this or not, but them cruise ships don't come back to port full. And they ain't no porta potties out in the sea. I won't go to the ocean. It is disgusting. I refuse to do it. So me and my mason, we'll go to the pool. Now look, I ain't much on that pool. But at least they're trying to clean it. You can, if I can't smell the chlorine getting off the elevator, I ain't getting in that water. Okay. Okay. Now, me and Mason Curtis, we don't just get in the water and float. We're the kind we want to jump. And so I have found that you can have these competitions with teenagers. Man, they just think everything's a game. So we have these cannonball competitions. And we run and jump. And here's what happens. When you splash in that water, that big old splash, water starts flying out. You splash in a pool enough, you can empty it. <laughs> and when it gets below the little suction cup thing on the side, you're not supposed to swim anymore. So you know what I found? If we'll just make enough splashing and get all the water out, we ain't got to do this no more. <laughs> we went out one day, and so helped me. There was a booger that walked out, so helped me. He weighed 552 pounds. He was massive, buddy. He walked out there. He had on a pair of uh, swimming trunks, so helped me. They should not have gone on that, brother. He had on a tank top. He had on the goggles that would look like... He honestly looked like a fly that had hit the front of my windshield at I-40. And I looked at that guy, and I said, you got to be... And he, I'm telling you, he got on the deep end of that pool. And I said, if this brother swan dives off the tip of this thing, I am leaving and never coming back. And so help me, he backed up. He went and did a run and jump and said, Cannonball! I ain't never seen water go hither and thither. I don't know how much water went out that day, but he emptied that pool fast. I said, we're done. I ain't got to come back down here all week. I ain't got to, I ain't got to swim no more. I ain't getting in this pool no more. It's empty. I ain't coming back down. I mean, it was, it had gotten so low. It was making that, you know, the little, the, the little side suction things. I told Mason, I said, come on, boy, we're going upstairs. We're going to get our clothes on. We're going to go, we're going to putt putt. We're going to go eat lunch. We ain't coming back. This thing's empty. We got back that night, woke up the next morning. I'm thinking, we ain't got to go to that pool. That pool's empty. I went down to that pool, and it was running over the top. <laughs> Yesterday, it was empty. Today, it's overflowing. What took that thing from empty to overflowing? Off in the deep end, there's this metal hose. And during the night while everybody's sleeping, that hose is hooked down to a deep well. And it refills that pool. So that what was empty yesterday is brand new and full today. Sometimes you get to the place where God, you get so messed up, you say, I've emptied out the bucket of mercy. I've messed up too much on God. God's mad at me. God's upset with me. It's never going to be right anymore. And you go to bed feeling like a failure. Go to bed feeling like there's nothing. Go to bed feeling like there's nobody. But you wake up the next day. And what the Bible says is when the sun came up in the eastern sky, God looked at the bucket of your life. And he said, I'm looking at that as if there was never a mess up. 
up as if they was never wrong, as if you never emptied out any of it. The mercies of God are brand new. What you did yesterday, it's in yesterday. Get over it. Get past it because God has sent you His goodness to let you know it's okay. Amen. This morning when that sun popped up over those eastern Tennessee hills, that was God's way of saying we're good. When that mockingbird flooded across that sky singing its song, that was God's way of saying, we're good. When the wind caressed the blades of grass in the morning dew, that was God's way of saying, we're good. When you got in that car this morning and had enough pennies and quarters in your pocket to go to McDonald's and get you a plain biscuit and a large coffee with two creams in it, no sugars, and a half a Splenda in there, that was God's way of letting you know we're good. This morning when you're sitting here in the house of God listening to this wonderful choir, being able to fellowship with these people, that's God's way of saying, I want you to know you're good. Ladies and gentlemen, right now, get over it. Get past it. Move on from it. See the goodness of God. God and say, Lord, I'm, I'm sorry I've been living back there. But number three, after you hear his love, and number two, after you see his goodness, number three, you have to keep on believing his plan. Do you remember back in chapter number seven, the temple is built or the tabernacle is standing, they brought the ark in, and David tells Nathan the prophet, he says, Nathan, I want to build the house of the Lord a temple of grandeur that the world will be envious of, knowing that our God stands above all gods. Nathan says, do it. God would be pleased. He walks out. God tells him, no, you're a man of blood, David. You can't do it. He comes back in and says, David, this is the covenant God makes with you called the Davidic covenant. He says, you will not build the temple, but the child of your offspring will build the temple. You ready? David held to that promise in chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, and in chapter number 10 and 11. You know what God tells him? The sword will not depart from your house. Your son is going to die. And do you know what David thought died with his boy? The promise of God. And that's why when David held Solomon in his arms, he said, God, I'm okay being at peace with you. And God said, Nathan, tell him, we're not at peace. I'm just as faithful on this side of the mess up as I was on that side of the mess up. Don't you think that just because mess-ups have come into your life that God's plan has got off track in your life? Don't think that just because there's been a failure in your family that God's plan has gotten off track in your life. Don't think that just because they walked out on you that God's plan is off track in your life. God's plans never get off track. God's promises never are broken on God's account. God's plans are never usurped by the mess-ups of man. I I'm telling you right now, I know you think that just because you messed up way back there and just because you stumbled way over there that God could not possibly use you. I'm telling you right now, as sure as I'm standing on both of my ten and a halves, it's a great big God that's bigger than your mess up and bigger than your problem and bigger than your issue and bigger than your suffering and bigger than your situation. And God will accomplish what he promised to accomplish. You can believe his plan. Tennessee is not what I had in my plan. Dying babies is not what you had in your plan. Sickness and disease is not what you had in your plan. Divorce invading your home is not what you had in your plan. That stumble or that fall is not what you had in your plan. That division in your family is not what you had in your plan. And you spend all of your days in a little spiritual ball saying, Lord, please don't let anybody find out about it. 
God's trying to tell you this morning. He's not mad at you. He's not upset with you. And while you're just wanting to be restored to Him, God says, I don't, I don't want to just be at peace with you. I want you to know I've got something special still planned for you. It grieves my soul how we cast off broken things. It grieves my heart when somebody in the church messes up. We feel like we, we can't be kind to them. It grieves my soul, mamas and daddies, that you feel in your heart that by showing love at all to your children, you can don't. Let's not be foolish. God is trying to show you this morning that there is no mess up that is bigger than His power. So this morning, it's time to get over it, to get past it, and to go with God. Dark the stain that sold man's nature. Long the distance that he fell. Far removed from hope and heaven. Into deep despair and hell. But there was a fountain opened. And the blood of God's own son. Purifies the soul and reaches deeper than the stain has gone. Praise the Lord for full salvation. God still lives upon the throne. And I know the blood still reaches deeper than the stain. As gone. Let's bow our heads this morning. In the presence of God Almighty. This morning you've never been saved. Brother Tyler, what do I do? You come find your place on this altar and say, God, I'm tired of living with it. I'm giving you my life. I'm giving you my sin. I'm giving you my mess ups. I'm giving you my failures. There's people already on the altar. I want you to come. Brother Tyler, I'm saved, but I just can't get over what I did back there. It's time to get over it. It's time to get... You can't change it. You can't upend it. You can't rearrange it. You may as well get over it and go with God. How many of you this morning in the house of the Lord, I won't embarrass you. I promise you that, but I will pray for you. Brother Tyler... I need you to help me to pray. Will you just pray for me? I want you to put your hand up, put it right back down. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Christians, here's what I want us to do. I want us to find us a place on this altar and make this way easy for those that have got something they need to get past this morning. In just a second, we're going to stand, and as we stand, you come in just a moment. Christians are going to lead the way and make it easy for you. Down here on the front, Brother Brandon, Brother Dave, Brother Terry, Brother Chris. Some of these men and women are down here, and we're going to take the Bible. We're going to be able to help you. Brother Tyler, I've never been saved. Today's the day to come. Brother Tyler, I've never been able to yoke up with the Lord and, and, and show that I've been saved by being baptized. Today's the day. Get over it. Get past it. God's got a future for you. Let's stand right now. Christians, I want you to come right now. Troy's going to sing. God bless you, beloved. That's it. God bless you, beloved. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I want you to come right now. I want you to come right now. Beloved, God cares about you, and you matter to God. Right now in our service, people are doing business with God. At the altar in their seats, our people are finding help in Christ. I don't want to end this service until I give you the chance to do business with God. 
if you are looking for hope in Christ. Jesus will save you. Maybe you've stumbled onto this broadcast and you don't even know that you're going to go to heaven. By putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, by repenting of your sins, Christ will save you. There's no amount of money that will save you. There's no amount of stuff that will save you. Only Christ. Or maybe you're there and you are saved, but your heart is broken and you just need prayer. Here's what I want you to do. We want to minister to you. We want our prayer team to be able to help you. For any more information about being saved, or maybe you just want someone to pray, do me a favor. I want you to email our team, prayer at hillcrestbaptist.org. By emailing that, someone will respond to you. I give you my word. They're going to encourage you. They're going to help you. And maybe you need to hear this one more time. Jesus loves you, and so do we. And until the next service, may the Lord bless you, and may the Lord keep you, is my prayer.